Welcome back to the Droid Doc, everybody, for episode 13, and we'll go straight on to the questions in an effort to uh, perhaps start to slightly reduce this massive pile. Bruce Westcott asks, You've explained about the attitude toward naval aircraft in the mid-war period, but by our standards of today, the carrier airstrike on the Zeppelin sheds was pretty forward-thinking. How did the young aviators who carried it out see it, and, knowing the Admiralty reviewed everything, was there anyone who had the wisdom to argue for the possibilities of naval air power in the Royal Navy? Well, the answer to that, yes, there were quite a few uh, naval air power proponents within the Royal Navy in the interwar period, and they took the lessons from World War I to heart. The Royal Navy was actually quite forward-thinking when it came to new technology, um, especially during the First World War period. So you had the Royal Naval Air Service, uh, you had the Royal Navy actually on land empl employing the first armoured cars, uh, well before the army got its tanks, and other such things like that. However, the Royal Navy suffered somewhat from the Royal Naval Air Service and the Royal Flying Corps being merged into the Royal Air Force in 1918, so they lost direct control over some aspects of their fleet air arm. And this created something of an inter-service rivalry, much the same as you see in all the major nations' various armed forces, and since certain aspects of naval air power were under the control of the RAF, they tended to play second fiddle to the RAF's needs, which was somewhat understandable, if not necessarily the most useful thing. However, it does have to be borne in mind that, to a certain degree, the detractors of air power were right, not in everything they said, but in their counter-arguments to the most forthright proponents of air power. As I believe I've mentioned before, Billy Mitchell's demonstration sinking the dreadnought battleship Ostfriesland was somewhat counterproductive. It was a very spectacular show and it convinced a lot of the general public that air power was the way forward, but the number of ways that he cheated and misrepresented the results meant that very few professional naval officers gave his results much credence and this calmed the actual development of naval air power in the interwar period. It basically he ins was insisting that aircraft could sink battleships and therefore the age of the battleship was effectively over. Practically speaking however in real life conditions this wasn't true and it would not be true in the 1920s, it wouldn't be true in the 1930s and it was basically untrue right up until the development of the last generation of late 1930s, early 1940s aircraft, which saw a significant increase in capability, which then made them fully capable of actually putting down battleships, albeit still using a lot more aircraft than the Mitchell used. And it's the result of this technological development that we see in World War II. And this tends to skew everything a little bit because the aircraft that the battleships and other ships would, that went into the World War II were designed against were not anywhere near as capable as the ones they actually ended up facing. Now obviously that is a risk all the time with technological advancement, um, but I have a feeling that had Mitchell been a little bit more conservative in his tests and a little bit more honest about them, then things might have been somewhat different because the the importance of naval firepower of naval aircraft firepower probably would have been taken more seriously by more naval officers and therefore led to more investment in anti-aircraft armament as opposed to the situation as it was which was basically that test was written off and other tests that began to indicate as time went on that aircraft were getting closer and closer to this capability in reality were disregarded somewhat because of the shadow that that particular test cast. But for what they understood of naval aircraft's potential, the Royal Navy, especially with the, some of those younger officers coming up through the ranks towards the mid and to late 1930s, did try to invest in naval aircraft as much as they could to perform the roles that, as far as they were aware, were realistically possible, and that was things like disrupting the enemy, uh, destroying their scouts, and slowing down the enemy fleet for the uh, big engagement that they thought was still necessary. Kevin Willemse asks, I seriously question the practical usefulness of the battlecruiser. On paper it makes sense, however why not just build cruisers to scout for the dreadnought line? 
Well, basically, it comes down to, well, pretty much look at the results of the fight between the World War One Scharnhorst and Eisenhower versus the Invincible and Inflexible. It, it effectively comes down to the fact that battle cruisers, as originally intended and as originally designed, chew through cruisers like there's no tomorrow. So building cruisers to scout for the Dreadnought line makes sense as long as the other side is building cruisers. Remembering that the battle cruiser was originally called the Dreadnought Armoured Cruiser, they were basically the next escalation. Um, the, the line of thinking behind them is basically exactly the same line of thinking that led to the development of things like the B-65, the Alaska, and the Stalingrad-Kronstadt in uh, World War II. And since uh, World War I lacked the ability to make the kind of rapid-firing 6- uh, and 8-inch caliber guns that you'd see on the Tiger class and for the British and the Des Moines class for the Americans, and I suppose also the Worcester class for the Americans, then there wasn't really much choice other than to go big or go home, as they say. Versus Arch says, How do you properly aim unstabilized naval guns in anything but calm sea due to waves rolling the ship? Well, the answer is basically you don't. Um, unstabilized guns were notoriously difficult to aim, and that's why battle ranges stayed pretty short. I mean, the the standard battle range that most tacticians thought they would be fighting at at the end of the 19th century was barely beyond the maximum effective range of the cannons that had been used at the Battle of Trafalgar. Um, I mean, the battle of uh, cannon arm ships tended to fight as closer than that where possible, mainly because their uh, cannons were shorter barrel and therefore they lost penetration at longer range. But, you know, sort of three, four miles, people weren't thinking much beyond that with unstabilized guns pretty much for those reasons. The general way that you would aim an unstabilized naval gun, once you had it aligned in roughly the sort of pointing in the direction and elevation that you thought, was pretty much unchanged again since Trafalgar. It was a case of if your guns are significantly affected by your ship rolling, then you take an eye on a level and you watch as your ship rolls and you would pull the trigger or the firing pin or however else you are choosing to trigger your guns um, around the time maybe when the ship was somewhere between 5 and 15 degrees away from horizontal depending on how fast the ship was rolling. And the idea of this was that the roll would impart some momentum down or up, depending on if you're rolling down or up, to the shell. And with the slight delay between you initiating the firing and the shell actually leaving the barrel, then the idea was that the shell would leave the barrel just before it hit horizontal, and hopefully that uh, vertical momentum that the roll was imparting would be corrected for by that that slight bit slightly being off angle um, and it would then arrive on target but obviously this was very much a do it by eye and feel method not particularly accurate over any kind of long distance which is says that that's why the battle ranges remain short amongst other other reasons but this was also one of the attractions of big heavy guns on the center line of a ship because obviously they are subject to less vertical motion than broadside guns. Graham Baxter asks, was there a particular reason for the proliferation of odd numbered battleship guns 11, 13, 15 inch in European navies while specific navies use even numbered guns uh, 12, 14, 16 etc? Well, taken as European and Pacific navies, not especially. Uh, the Japanese, being one of the two big Pacific navies alongside the Americans, uh, tended to model their ships after the British in most of the time period we're talking about. And the British are a European navy, but the vast majority of their dreadnought fleet, right up until the development of the first super dreadnoughts, were all armed with 12-inch guns. So the Japanese also armed with 12-inch guns, the Americans had 12-inch guns, uh, it was basically really the Germans who went with the 11-inch. Now, once you started going beyond that, yes, the uh, the French would start looking at sort of 13.4-inch guns. The Germans kept with 11-inch for a while, then they went to 12, then they were going up for sort of 13.8s and 15s. Um, the French never really went much above their slightly larger than 13-inch guns in World War One, um, and then obviously went 15-inch in World War Two. 
The British went 12 inch, 13.5 inch, 15 inch, and then 16. The Americans went 12, 14, 16. Um, so it's not quite as clear cut as you might think. Um, the Russians are just, well, let's not even go there. But in some large part where you can draw distinctions, it's mostly down to size, weight, and firepower issues which tend to lend themselves, as we've mentioned before when we're talking about upgrading gun turrets, the kind of rule of thumb of lose a gun, go up two inches in calibre, it gives you a turret that is sl oh, usually around about the same weight, ballpark, might be slightly heavier, might be slightly lighter depending on exactly what you're doing, um, but gives you more firepower. So there's, if you have a 12-inch gun, there's not a tremendous amount of sense in going to a 13-inch gun, because you're going to get significant weight and size increase in your turret, but not particularly significant increase in your broadside. Whereas if you go from a 12 to a 14, or in the British case, a 12 to a 13.5, or 13.4 for the French, 13.8 for the Germans, you are actually getting enough of an increase in firepower to either justify the increase in weight, if you're going from twin 12 to twin 13 point something, um, or if you're going from triple 12 to... Uh, dual 14 or something like that then it or it still makes sense in that in that way and you see that again in the american standards when they go from triple 14 to dual 16 but the other thing to bear in mind as well is that the french and german navies didn't actually use the inch system the japanese used it initially because they were buying off the British, but they went over to metric. The Americans and the British were the only ones who really used the imperial system throughout the era, and the French and the Germans started right off at the beginning using the metric system and never changed. So they were going for things in millimetres, and that's when you end up with things like 380 millimetre guns, which are technically like 14.96 inches, but effectively near as that makes no difference, 15 inches. And because everybody likes to have, in human nature, likes to have nice round even numbers, um, when you look at something like, say, a 14-inch gun, that's 357 millimeters rounding up, which isn't a particularly comfortable number, but 350 is, and that's why you see 350 on the Mackensons, which translates to 13.8 inches. There's also a degree of basic one-upmanship involved. The Japanese wanted the Congos to be slightly better than existing battlecruisers. The biggest and most powerful existing battlecruisers had 13.5-inch guns, so they had 14-inch guns. Um, the American standards went for 14-inch guns because they slightly overmatched the 13.5-inch guns in their mind, and then the British built the Queen Elizabeth and Revenge with 15-inch guns, so then they had to go to 16-inch, etc., etc. Carl Dubay asks... Uh, have a question about an old quote and the modern Royal Navy. Way back in the 1700s, uh, Voltaire wrote, In this country it is wise to kill an admiral from time to time to encourage the others. Uh, that was in reference to the Royal Navy's execution of Admiral Bing for supposedly not being aggressive enough. Um, he says, In your opinion, should Jellicoe have been shot for turning away from the German fleet in 1916? Uh, in Voltaire's words, Pour encourager les autres. Well, not really. Um... The situations are somewhat different. Um, although the Royal Navy still expected its commanders to go out there and be aggressive and win, you have to remember, well, apart from the fact that virtually everybody at the time disagreed with Admiral Bing's execution, um, at the time of Admiral Bing's execution, although the Royal Navy was one of, if not the strongest navy in the world, it was in quite a serious fight with almost everybody else. And the fact was its domination of the seas was not anywhere near as complete as it was at the beginning of World War I. Um, it was fighting for control left, right and centre. And in those circumstances, an inch of weakness would hand the enemy a lot more of the advantage and the initiative than a defeat would. Because a defeat would, in theory, savage the enemy almost as badly as they savaged you, which would cripple their ability to exploit their victory. Whereas if you just withdrew then they had control. But if you look at the time of Jellicoe, there's that famous quote, Jellicoe was the only man who could have lost the First World War in the afternoon, and it's pretty much accurate. And Jellicoe knew this. Um, Jellicoe knew full well that going into the Battle of Jutland, 
the British had control of the oceans, and as long as he didn't lose, Britain would still have control of the oceans at the end, which was kind of the point of the Royal Navy. Um, so when he saw the torpedo attack incoming, the standard Royal Navy doctrine at the time was to turn away from the torpedoes to preserve the fleet, because let's face it, if you are trying to charge down an enemy battle fleet that you outnumber and you deliberately run into torpedoes, knowing full well that those torpedoes have a very good chance of reducing your numbers down to a level where you could be defeated, you're probably pretty stupid. Um, unless you're very confident that you can avoid them, which Jellico wasn't. So... Um, he made the right strategic move. I mean, yes, in theory, he could have avoided some of them, and maybe he could, maybe he couldn't, and maybe it would have forced a more glorious fight, but the risks involved for the wider picture of British sea power were far too great, and he decided this was not a plan to follow. Um, you actually see this pretty much almost everywhere, um, even during the Battle of Leyte Gulf, the Japanese preferred to turn away from the American destroyer's torpedoes rather than charge them down uh, and possibly eat a torpedo or two and lose a number of battleships, even though they knew quite clearly at that point in the war they were losing. Jay Lozier asks, How did Billy Mitchell's arrogance and incompetence concerning air power's effectiveness hurt the development of naval air power? I swear I, <laughs> I, I didn't go on my previous rant deliberately this has just come up as on the next page of questions um it says he continues his 1920s demonstrations are widely held to show usn incompetence and stupidity but the usn was keenly interested in what bombs in particular could do against ships at the time there was no data on this as no ships had actually suffered bomb damage so the usn wanted some good data to use in later ships and designs and refits something that mitchell never really grasped in reality the usn was saying bombs possibly combined with other ordnance could be used to sink ships in the future the difference was the usn saying aircraft of the 20s and 30s were not that effective while Mitchell was overselling the capabilities of the aircraft in question. Well, yeah, pretty much see the uh, the earlier rant. I pretty much agree with everything you're saying there. Um, but you do bring up some interesting points that uh, can be uh, talked about a bit further. And yes, the, the American Navy was very interested in what this test could do and how they could refine their own ships. And they were very irritated with Mitchell because... Part of the agreement was that Mitchell would go in, bomb the ship, then some American observers would go on board, see what the damage had done, and po then possibly work out how they could counter it. Then they'd leave the ship, then it'd be bombed a bit more, then they could have a look at that damage, etc., etc. But after the first um, such check, Mitchell then just plastered Ostfriedland with enough uh, explosives to finally put it down without any kind of legitimate break for USN observers to go in and observe it. And they were incredibly ticked off about this because it basically meant that outside of proving that a battleship with no crew and everything open, no anti-aircraft firepower and completely stationary could eventually be sunk by large numbers of strategic bombers, it didn't help the American Navy in any way, shape or form work out how to actually counter that other than maybe put some more anti-aircraft guns on it, which, to be fair, was a lesson they did learn very well in World War II. But, as I said in... Uh, the previous uh, response to the question earlier on. Uh, yeah, it hurt the development of naval air power in that because it was so obviously a biased test, it meant that uh, other proponents of air power tended to get lumped in with him and therefore not listened to as seriously as the more reasonable ones perhaps should have been. And that affected both sides because it meant ships weren't necessarily designed and equipped as well as they could have been. But it also meant that there was a certain amount of hostility towards aircraft and uh, maybe even perhaps an underestimation of their exact capabilities, which meant less investment and some rather weird dis decisions in terms of what aircraft were procured during the interwar period. And the second part of his question, how did having a separate naval aviation arm help the Imperial Japanese Navy and the US Navy develop more effective naval aircraft and naval aviation doctrine compared to the RAF's ignoring RN fleet aviation needs before World War II? Other countries with a separate air force that controlled naval aviation seem to suffer from similar problems during World War II as the Royal Navy did at the start. Well, this is true to an extent. Um... I wouldn't necessarily describe 
giving the Imperial Japanese Armed Forces another branch to compete with uh, all the other branches as being necessarily an entirely wise decision. Um, yeah, just look at the complete uh, interfactional fighting between the Japanese Navy's Air Forces and the Japanese Army's Air Forces and just see how well that particular little debacle went. And, uh, and the, the Royal Navy... Its fleet air arm wasn't ignored, but it was on pretty much the bottom of the RF's priority list. They they did get aircraft, um, but when you look at the Royal Navy's aircraft, quite a lot of them in the interwar period tended to be uh, modified versions of aircraft that the Royal Air Force was getting anyway. And in some cases that was a good thing, in other cases not such a good thing, because obviously an aircraft that's designed to operate on land is not necessarily the best going to be the best operating at sea um whereas uh, the surprising number of la of, of sea based aircraft that have been designed as such make fairly successful transitions over to land the f4 phantom 2 being a uh, prime example in terms of the development of their use well the actual use of the aircraft all three services being considered here um had the ability to make use of their aircraft um, to develop tactics for them, etc. It basically just came down to the Royal Navy not maybe necessarily having the full range of uh, aircraft and designs and say in the designs and capabilities of their aircraft as the other services. So they kind of had to make do with what they had. And eventually, when they did get control back, there was obviously perhaps understandably a little bit of a backlash against going in with a thing that looks very much like a thing from on land which did lead to a few um somewhat questionable designs coming out of the royal navy once they had control back uh especially in relation to world war Two. i mean things like the full mar on the firefly they were all right but they uh I wouldn't like necessarily to take a Fulma or a Firefly up against a Wildcat, a Zero, or a Hellcat. Um, although the Firefly, if it got a chance, could put some serious hurt in. But anyway, um, yeah, they could, they could have done better, and there's a reason that the Royal Navy was using sea fires quite a bit um, towards the end of World War II. I think the main thing that the Japanese and the Americans got out of it, especially the Americans, was the ability to set up a dedicated infrastructure for the training of naval pilots. And that obviously allowed, especially the Americans, to massively expand their naval air, air arm very quickly in the Second World War without putting any undue strain on US Army Air Force at the time uh, training and recruitment centers. And it meant that with more experience of designing aircraft specifically for carrier operations, they were able to come up with aircraft that probably better suited um, the seaborne environment than perhaps a number of the British did. Because if you have a look at a lot of British aircraft, even the ones that were specifically designed for carrier service, um, most of them were inline radio, uh, inline engines, sorry, not radial engines. Um, things like uh, the Firefly, the Barracuda, etc. And that kind of nose is not the best for an aircraft carrier landing. You look at the Japanese and the Americans and most of their aircraft, as well as things, admittedly, things like the Rock, the Skewer and the Swordfish, are all radial engined aircraft, which have much better visibility forward and are therefore able to be uh, used more effectively on carriers because your vision is a lot better and that's very critical when you have a very very short deck relatively speaking to land on and now over to some of the discord questions and for something completely different paul from chicago writes were simondite vessels as poor as claimed by critics such as napier from what i understand under a good captain they might be the fastest sail in the fleet but they were regarded by men like napier a man for whom i have the highest regard as crank now, if you're thinking, as I suspect some of you there are, what the hell is he on about? What is a Simondite vessel? And uh, how many guns does it carry? Well, these are not ships of the era we've just spent near enough the last 20 minutes talking about. These are ships, wooden sailing ships of the line, in the era just before ironclads came into effect. So we're talking about the second quarter, maybe into the, just into the third quarter of the 19th century. 
So take a look at this. This is a Simondite warship for you, and you might be thinking, so what's any different? It looks like any other Age of Sail British warship. Um, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is actually mostly underwater. You see, as we've mentioned in a previous video, most British-built warships in the Age of Sail tended to be slightly shorter than their opposite numbers, and this made them more manoeuvrable and more seaworthy, but made them slower on average than longer and slightly less agile vessels um, of the type most commonly favoured by the French amongst others. Now part of that stability was that the underwater hull tended to have a very pronounced uh, capital U shape um, with in many cases almost a semi-squared off looking cross section. This gave them a great amount of storage space underwater for food, gunpowder, shot, all sorts of things like this, and made them quite stable, but contributed to their lack of speed. And Captain Sir William Simmons had this idea that with the Royal Navy now so preeminent that nobody would dare fight it, having ships that were slower than enemy ships was a bad idea because then they'd just all run away. So he decided that in order to increase the speed, he was going to change the underwater hull form and it would be more of a V shape rather than a U shape. So much sharper, less, much less volume underwater, and this would therefore increase speed. So this seemed to be a good idea. However, and that's a big however, so they needed to be quite wide because obviously if you just make a V shape hull form on your standard hull shape, you're going to end up with something that's going to tip over very easily and just ask the Swedes how well that particular uh, facet of naval design works. So their hulls were a little wider and this allowed them to put more sails on, which obviously made them a bit faster again, which was all good. Um, However, believe it or not, when it comes to ships in general, and especially warships that need to fire guns, there is such a thing as too stable a ship. Because, you see, a very stable ship doesn't lean easily, and when it does lean, it tends to revert back to being static and level very quickly. Now, you might think this is a good thing, um, but it's not necessarily because a slightly more unstable ship will take longer to roll back, but that means that the rolling motion is slower and easier to compensate for, whereas a very stable ship, when it is inevitably forced to roll by the motion of the sea, will revert back to its normal position very quickly. And uh, that is not the kind of movement that can really be compensated for easily and would jerk the ship around as well. And that jerking around would put a lot of stress on the rigging and the rigging would therefore wear out a lot quicker than on other ships which could roll slower. One of the other things I mentioned was the fact that the U-shaped hulls allowed a great amount of storage underneath. The V-shaped hulls, by cutting down that undersea volume, which is obviously the area where you can put lots of heavy stuff, meant that you couldn't carry as much in terms of stores and shot and gunpowder in safe locations, and having a hull that basically just keeps sloping up and up and up is also very inconvenient for storing things unless you've got sort of very weird shaped containers. And finally, in terms of weaknesses, because of this uh, much reduced space underwater, they were a lot more sensitive as to what exactly you put in the hull in certain locations. So if you evenly distributed the load, which is called in naval terms is called trimming the ship, then they were pretty quick. But in very heavy seas, because of this sort of tendency to jerk around and move a lot, or if you badly stowed the ship, you could significantly drop its speed. So it was a lot, lot uh, more of a technical exercise to actually stow a Simondite ship compared to, to a regular ship. It wasn't all bad though, because they did achieve their objective of being faster, at least when conditions were right. Um, they didn't need to carry so much ballast because they were wider, which meant that more, uh, more weight in the ship could be allocated to useful things like guns and sails and men rather than just inert ballast to stop you toppling over. And their gun decks were obviously wider, because the ship was wider, and they're also higher up away from the waterline, which mean, meant that their guns worked more efficiently, because the crews had more space to work in, and uh, they were more likely to be able to use their guns in rough weather. So, with all that in mind, they weren't quite as poor as some of their more vociferous critics claimed, 
Um, for the purposes they were designed for, they did work fairly well if they were somewhat sensitive about actually doing so. But overall, given the needs of the Royal Navy, they were perhaps somewhat too specialised. And I think Napier might have had a generally good point in that the Royal Navy did not need its entire fleet uh, converted to ships of this type. Uh, a, a squadron or two or several dozen ships of this kind to run down the enemy was a good idea, but not the entire fleet. Nietzsche asks... When exactly did the Dreadnought era end and why? Um, was it only to the fact that turrets with three or more guns became more reliable? So this is referring to the technical definition of a Dreadnought, which was actually fairly rapidly superseded. Um, and eh, to a certain degree, having triple turrets meant the development of Super Dreadnoughts was a lot easier. But the technical Dreadnought era came to an end more when people started to combine the advances in naval guns with advances in the lessons learned from the first Dreadnoughts. Because pretty much everybody apart from the Americans started off the Dreadnought era with wing turrets. And eventually everyone got with a program of all centerline armament. The centerline armament went up from the South Carolina's four centerline guns to five uh, and then they started putting bigger guns on as i said with the advances of naval technology so the official dreadnought era came to an end with the start of the super dreadnought era when hms orion was launched with its 10 13.5 inch guns in twin turrets all on the center line there were a few other ships that had triple turrets at the time uh, the austro-hungarian tajets of glass are a prime example of that but whilst broadly the entire period is thought of as the dreadnought era because it's all big gun battleships the technical definition of the original dreadnought as it was superseded around 1910 1911 by the launch of the first super dreadnoughts and they kind of just yeah super dreadnoughts stayed around for a while and then were exceeded towards the end of world war one by the designs with um significant numbers of 15 inch and 16 inch guns but by that point people had stopped adding uh, superlatives to the word dreadnought and finally for this week uh, portugal caralho or caralho i don't know maybe correct me if i'm wrong um says what was the role of the portuguese navy perhaps unsurprisingly given his name in world war one well it's a little known fact portugal is actually the longest standing ally of Great Britain, so it shouldn't come as a great surprise to find out that Portugal was decidedly not on Germany's side in World War One. The first actions between Portuguese and German troops were clashes between their colonies, so the first actions by the Portuguese Navy were ferrying naval infantry and regular infantry out to the colonies to reinforce and seize back control where necessary from German troops. However, this all took place before a formal declaration of war took was actually announced, and uh, since the Germans were the ones who initiated these uh, surprise attacks, the Portuguese thought it was only fair to mount a rather significant naval operation led by the armoured cruiser Vasco da Gama, which then proceeded to seize a total of 72 German and Austro-Hungarian vessels in various Portuguese harbours right before Portugal officially declared war in March 1916. Now, apart from guarding its colonies, the Portuguese Navy's main contribution to the First World War came in three fields, first of which was general convoy protection and merchant guarding in the North Atlantic, uh, which was quite useful, along with obviously defending their own coastline. Second of which was defending the Cape Verde Islands, which were actually very important to the war effort. They were a major coaling station, and a lot of submarine telegraph cables that connected various continents all came ashore there. So defending that was fairly critical as a German raider assault that was successful would have been very bad for the Allied war effort. And finally, the escort of troop convoys. The Portuguese actually sent a fairly substantial portion of their military to fight on the Western Front and also to help out in campaigns in Southern Africa. So, with that said, that brings us to the end of another episode of The Dry Dock. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. 
and I will see you again in the next video.